Thank you, and, Dwight. Yep. So thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm happy to be here. I wish I was uh, back home in Toledo uh, to see people's faces. Um, I'm very excited to be here to talk about this topic, something that I've been working on quite a bit this year, um, but actually more generally and more broadly about rural communities in rural America. Um, so as Dwight mentioned that I was at the University of Toledo from 2003 to 2017 teaching economics. And my work was always looking at the relationship between racial diversity and government spending, looking specifically at school district spending and police spending. Because one of the things I wanted to see was kind of what is the interaction between our community's racial makeup and spending and support for public services. So when I got to CAP two years ago, um, one of the things we want to look at is looking at issues of rural communities because of the election and try to see, you know, what are the things that certain um, that we don't really address. And in doing this work, and this is work with uh, several colleagues, um, one of the things that we kind of looked at is that we don't talk about rural communities properly, because when we think about rural America, we have this image of, you know, this old white male farmer in Iowa. And that's kind of how our discussions about rural America are surrounded. That's how our policy is focused into the, even to the point where all rural policy basically is in the Department of Agriculture, even though in rural communities, agriculture only makes up about 20% of employment. So in the work that we did at CAP, it was about kind of redefining and redefining the narrative about rural communities and talking about the wide diversity, not just demographically, like in terms of race or LGBTQ status, immigrant um, populations, but also in terms of industry. So looking at manufacturing, mining, e even one of the things is uh, the service sector is the largest employer of all rural communities. So as part of this, had a particular focus on rural communities in the South because they're predominantly African-American. And one of the things that I want to focus on is just kind of highlight the issues that they face. So then uh, this is work that we started uh, last year, early 2019, and kind of we're building up to this big rural report to kind of talk about how do we revitalize rural communities. And then in 2020, COVID hit. And so we pivoted to kind of focus on doing a lot of work on COVID and the impact throughout the economy. And so what I want to do is kind of focus, well, what about COVID in rural communities? And to do a focus on what's happening, some of the issues in rural communities and showing how COVID, you know, at the time when we started, how it might affect rural communities. And then as the pandemic spread throughout to kind of highlight those issues, because one of the problems is that rural issues just are not elevated to its proper level. And so they're always kind of left behind. And so a lot of the work that we do at CAP is really trying to elevate the issues of rural communities so that in policy that we could actually talk about it. And so for this talk, what I want to do is focus specifically on the intersection of COVID and race in the rural South. And while it's going to be kind of like a narrow topic, the purpose is to kind of highlight some of these longstanding issues. Because while COVID has decimated everything that's happened and kind of re change everything that we've done and how we how we go about life these days, this is not a new problem. And the impacts that we find are not new. And it's kind of has been a longstanding one. And so what I want to try to do is bring in what this kind of historical impacts through this lens of the rural South, how that's caused a lot of problems that we have today. So what I have the map here is the outbreak of COVID cases, new COVID cases for the week, August 15th to the 22nd. And so these are all the counties and it's broken down by kind of severity. And so what the red color represents is um, we have over 100 new cases per 100,000 people. And so what we do is we take the number of new cases for that week divided by uh, the population and multiply 100,000. So that way we are comparing like by like. And so that's kind of the same scale. So the red represents uh, over 100 cases, new cases per 100,000. So that kind of says it's called what uh, COVID-19 red zone. And so this, take, this data is taken from a website called Daily Yonder. And so that says that's like a high outbreak. That's a, something to uh, cause concern. If we go green, it's under that. Um, so that's under 100 per 
100,000 people. And then the gray is that there's no new cases. And so one of the things with data analysis and data visualization that's really nice is that you can talk about issues and talk about store, stories, but maps a lot of times tell a story, a very clear and vivid story. And so what this map shows is that the South is getting has a, is our red zones where they have the highest number of new cases relative to other areas. So there's other parts of the Midwest. Uh, you see some in the Great Plains area, so some Montana, uh, North Dakota. You look at California, so a lot of that, that's a, a rural part of California where there's a lot of agriculture and farmland uh, is being hit hard, um, but consistently areas in the South. Now the dark colors, like the dark red and the dark green, represent non-metropolitan counties. And then the light red and the light green are metropolitan counties. So what I'm gonna do here is stop for a moment and talk about how we define rural America. And this is actually one of the biggest kind of issues and kind of goes into the myths of about rural America. There's no really one good definition of rural community. So there's the kind of standard definition that's from the Office of Management Budget, and they define it based off of population. And so you have a population above 50,000, um, you have like a metropolitan area. And then anything below that is gonna be called non-metropolitan. And so one of the problems when we talk about rural communities is that we define rural as basically not urban. And we don't define rural in and of itself. And so there's other definitions where you talk about like micropolitan. So these are non-metropolitan counties that are close to metro centers. And then you have the non-core, which is like these completely rural kind of remote areas. But there's so many different types of definitions. But one of the things we want to kind of focus on is that going back to this map, you see that the dark red are non-metropolitan counties that have high outbreaks of new cases. And then the light red are the high outbreak in metropolitan counties. And so when you see this map of the South, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, what is driving this? Why is it that we see a huge outbreak this, you know, on August 15th, this is five months after really that the pandemic started to hit. Why is it that after this time, we still, we still see a huge outbreak? Because when we think about the outbreak when it first started was the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut tri-state area. Uh, early March, we had the stories of New York City. Actually, the first uh, outbreaks were in Washington State, the Seattle area. And if you look at the map, those places are doing really well. So there's, you know, very few or no cases. So the question is, why is it five months later that the South has been hit hard? And so to kind of answer that, one of the things we want to look at is, well, let's look at some of these other kind of dimensions of economic outcomes for different communities. So here we have a map um, of upward mobility or economic mobility. And so again, this is county based analysis. And what this figure shows, this is the probability that an individual reaches the top income quintile if they grew up in a low income household. So what this comes from is comes from this uh, website called Opportunity Insights Research done by Raj Chetty, an economist out of Harvard. And so what he did is he took data, census data and IRS data on uh, household income for individuals who were born in the early 80s. He looked at, okay, well, what income, what income were you at that point? And then in that 1980, he said, okay, let's fast forward 35 years. What income quintile are you as a young adult? And so for here, you're looking at someone who in 1980, their parent, parents' household income was at the 20, below the 25th percentile. Then you look at, okay, well, where were they as a young adult in 2015? So we're looking at percentages of, look, of being able to move up to the top income, income quintile. So that's the top 20%. So basically the question asked, did you experience economic mobility throughout your life? And so the top quartile is gonna be the dark gray, and then we go to dark red where the lowest quartile, so people had the lowest probability of moving up to the top 20 percentile. And then you look, a lot of it is in the South, and a lot of it is in the areas that we see these high COVID outbreaks. And so, in a lot of the work that we've done is that you see other measures like persistent poverty. So if you look at people who are poverty, you know, poverty rates in 1980, 
2010, you see, are they still have a high level of poverty? So it's like persistent poverty, the outcome looks the same. You look at low educational attainment. So the percentage of people whose highest educational attainment was less than high school, a lot of it's gonna be the South. We look at median income, medium household income. The lowest percentage is always gonna be down the South. So one of the things we wanna figure out is well, what is it about the South? Why is it, why do we see these consistent cases and what does that mean for the COVID outbreak? So the animating question, and you know, you think about research is like, okay, well, why? What can explain this? So the question is what is driving the lower outcomes and the greatest susceptibility from this pandemic? Why do certain communities suffer more than others? And so a lot of people will say, oh, well, it's race, right? That this is the area that has the highest percentage of African-Americans, both in metro and in non-metro area. And a lot of the work that we do at CAP is really pushing that when we talk about rural communities, it's not just, you know, white, it's more white than metro areas, but it's not completely white. And so it's not just about African-Americans in the South, when we think about tribal communities, native communities in the Great Plains, in the Southwest, we think about uh, Latinx population throughout the country. There's a lot of uh, Latinx people and a lot of uh, migrants in rural communities. And so a lot of the work that we try to push is that these rural communities are very diverse racially and ethnically. So we talk about race and say, okay, well, race is probably why we see all these poor outcomes. And race, and there's a lot of stories that have been told throughout this pandemic, about race being a driving factor with these higher COVID outbreaks. But we have to be careful when we talk about race because race is not the issue. The issue is racism because it's not African-Americans are more likely to capture COVID because they're African-American. It's there are systems in place that make it diff difficult for African-Americans for native communities on reservations, for Latinx people, uh, immigrants in certain communities to be able to combat this. And so we wanna be able to differentiate when we actually talk about race, we have to be explicit about what we're talking about. What we're talking about is racism. But in, even when we talk about racism, we have to be careful about how we talk about it because when we talk about racism, we think about the violence. So like this image here is the uh, Bloody Sunday from the when they were trying to attempt the march from Selma to Montgomery. But again, racism is not about the violence. What we have to actually focus on is this concept of structural racism. So when I'm saying that we have to be careful when we say racism, racism is not just about the violence per perpetrated on different groups. The violence is there to maintain a system that creates unequal outcomes. And that's what it is about structural racism. It's about having a system that creates unequal outcomes. And so it's that system that is driving all these adverse economic outcomes to persistent poverty, the lower prospects for economic mobility and the COVID outbreaks. And so what I wanna take the rest of the time of this talk is to actually talk about structural racism and then how that feeds into what's happened in during this pandemic, but throughout history. So how is it that a structure can be created to be racist? And so with a specific focus on the South, the South in early 20th century worked hard to attract businesses. So first they were trying to, they knew that they couldn't, um, they need a new industry to build up. And so their industrial policy was about attracting firms from the North down to the South. And the way they did that is by creating what's called a friendly business environment. And so what do we mean by a friendly business environment? So what you would say is that, okay, we have low taxes here. We have um, a workforce that is not gonna be used, unionized. And so you have these factors, you think about um, state uh, local incentive, incentives to have businesses so they don't pay as much in tax. They'll have services, things like that. And so in the early 20th century, a lot of it was doing anti-worker policy. So having, you know, in the mid fifties, they passed a lot of what's called right to work laws, which would kind of disincentivize having unions. And they would actually, there was kind of a language in terms of, you know, there was a lot of unionization in the North, a lot of these major cities. And so firms found it attractive 
to have places where they don't have a non-unionized workforce. So this is what they call a friendly business environment. What this translated to was a low wage labor market. So you don't have to pay people as much. You don't have to provide protections for them. And these are things that would are considered business costs that would be lower in the South relative to the North. But when you have a low tax environment, one of the problems with that is that taxes are what pay for services like infrastructure, schools, upkeep, maintenance, things like that. And so if you have a low tax base and you don't have that, then these services are not going to be there. And so what happens is that over time, you have minimal level of public infrastructure. Over time, you have lower quality public education. And these things then have a feedback effect where it becomes difficult to then be able to lift up these services to actually help all the residents. Now, when we say there's going to be a minimal level of public services, it wasn't that across the board services were poor. It's that certain areas would get less public services than others because politicians, policymakers would have a limited revenue base. So they have to make decisions about where they're going to invest. And so this is why you'd always hear these stories about being on certain sides of the tracks of railroad tracks. You have a railroad that goes through the city and certain areas get more funding, get more resources than others. And so a lot of that's because of this low tax environment. You look at a low wage labor market, it's not even just about paying people less, but you actually want to keep people low skilled because you want to have this low wage labor market that pushes into these industries. And so if you have more, not just, you know, K-12 public education, but higher ed, then people are going to be able to achieve higher, get higher skills, ask for more money and push for more. And so there was a lot of diminishment of these public education. And so that's why you look now in 2020, the South has the lowest educational attainment because there's a lot of these higher ed uh, education deserts where there's less, less um, institutions of higher ed throughout the South because that wasn't, that wasn't conducive to the kind of environment the South was trying to attract. So one of the other things was that it wasn't just about attracting businesses from the North, but then during the 60s and 70s, there was a push to attract businesses from um, overseas. So Germany, Switzerland, Japan, a lot of these companies, uh, a lot of these um, Southern areas, these politicians, policymakers were then were trying to attract firms uh, from overseas. But then the problem with that kind of scheme, that kind of framework is that at some point, US was no longer the low wage labor market. And so then firms went to Mexico, firms went to other uh, South and Central American countries, firms went over to China and other Asian countries. So now you no longer attract any more businesses, businesses flee, and all you're left is an area with poor public services, declining growth, and then these things led to these problems of people moving out. So people who were growing up in the 70s and 80s, um, so uh, education deserts are areas that don't have institutions of higher ed. Um, so this is like a neighborhood of say like 50 miles. There are no community colleges, no vocational schools, no, um, uh, no other colleges or universities. So that that area is a desert. So that if, you, if you're a person who lives there and you wanna go to institutions of higher education, you can't go to one nearby. You have to go uh, far away. And there's a lot more of those deserts in the South than there are in the North and in some parts of the West. And so now you have in the 80s and 90s places with poor public services, declining growth. And then if you wanna get ahead, there's no firm that you can go to and work your way up to management. You have to go away to college, go away to get firms, and then you have this population drain. And then with that population drain, that further puts a burden on the tax system because now you have less of an income tax base, less of a sales tax base. And again, now because that revenue base is declining, you're putting less into public infrastructure, education, things like that. And then, so now you have poor infrastructure, you have people leaving, and then you have, because there's less people, you think about hospitals. There's a huge, over the last 15, 20 years, there's been a huge number of hospital closures. 
And in fact, 90% of the hospital closures over the last 15 years have been in rural communities. And so reason why is because there's less demand. If you have an older population, then there's not going to be the demand for the kind of services that keep hospitals, keep their expenditures up. So a lot of times you see this, um, hospitals will lose uh, their OB practice, their, uh, OBGYN practice because there's no young couples there. So they lose that, then those doctors leave, and then it becomes more difficult, and then they more difficult to be financially viable. So now you have a region in declining population growth, declining tax base for to maintain public structures, really poor public infrastructure, and then you have a virus that comes in that spreads, and it's going to exacerbate the issues in these rural communities. So it's bad enough in major cities, but then in rural communities where they don't have the base to be able to combat these uh, viruses, it's going to make it more difficult. One of the other things that I haven't mentioned is this issue of broadband access. So one of the things that we found with this, what we see with this pandemic is that everything, we have this lockdown and except for essential, except for workers in essential jobs, what we have is people having to stay home and engage in remote work, engage in remote education, which you guys, I don't need to talk about, you know all about this, but because you have high speed access, broadband access, there's the ability to do that. And in a lot of these rural communities, there is no broadband access. So there is no ability to do remote work. There's no ability to do remote education. Even, it's not even and then if you don't have a job and you're trying to get on unemployment insurance or you're trying to find jobs, a lot of these people pre-pandemic would go to these places like a public library to be able to get internet access. But if you have to stay at home and libraries are closed, what are you going to do? So now we have these rural areas that are even further behind and already creating this huge, a larger gap. So we have that this environment became ripe for COVID to decimate the region and cause difficulties because of this long historical push to have this low wage labor market and this friendly business environment that didn't allow the area to grow and actually progress. So what I want to look now is what are some of the immediate solutions and broad solutions? A lot of things I've talked about, this we're talking about decades worth of issues that need to be fixed and they're not going to be fixed in one day. But there are some things that we can do that can actually really kind of mitigate some of the issues. So the first is Medicaid expansion. And when we talk about Medicaid expansion, we're talking about the Affordable Care Act. And you know, the biggest thing about that was about uh, uninsured and the uninsured population and making sure people are insured. But the other aspect of Medicaid expansion that people don't talk about as much is in terms of hospitals and financial viability. One of the biggest difficulties for hospitals is this issue of uncompensated care, where they, if you need help, they have to provide services. And in a lot of cases, there's gonna be uncompensated care. The Medicaid expansion actually provided funds to help defray those costs of uncompensated care. And this is actually a big issue during this pandemic because there's a lot of, talked about a lot of hospital closures, but even the hospitals that stayed open, they, at the beginning of this pandemic, they stopped doing all their elective surgeries and all their elective operations because they want to keep their hospital open to be able to handle the virus and the pandemic. Now doing that, while that's the thing you need to do to be able to combat this virus, it actually decreased their revenue stream because that's how they were able to keep up and make their money and help with their financial viability is by having these elective surgeries and operations. So now you get rid of that. And if you don't, if you're in a state that doesn't have Medicaid expansion, now your uncompensated costs have gone up and it becomes more difficult to actually run your operations. And so with Medicaid expansion, the states that had it were less likely to have hospital closures than states that didn't. And a lot of these states that didn't have Medicaid expansion were states in the South. And so we see a lot of these hospital closures are states in the South. The other one is a higher minimum wage. And so this is one of the things where it's kind of a proxy for combating that low wage labor market, that when you have a higher minimum wage, while it's a higher cost for businesses, it actually helps with terms of consumption. And so what we think about it is that one of the problems is that when we have this lockdown, we have this pandemic, you have less revenue going to businesses and small businesses. 
but that's because people don't have income or wealth to be able to spend. And so when you have a higher minimum wage, there's more money in people's pockets, more money to spend, spend locally in the community. And then that actually helps with the viability of a lot of small businesses. And then finally, going to the issue of race, one of the things, so some of the other, uh, well, my major work is on rural communities and looking at revitalized rural communities. The other thing I look at is racial disparities in the labor market, specifically at the unemployment rate. And I've done a lot of work showing that there's a huge gap in the unemployment rate between African-Americans and whites, as well as Latinx and whites. And there's also issues in terms of gender. And whether the economy is good or the economy is bad, the ratio of black to white unemployment rate has always been double. And so it's one of those things where that's where structural racism kind of factors in again, where you have this system that creates these unequal outcomes. And so that left to the market, we're gonna have one black unemployment rate that's double the white unemployment rate. Now, a lot of that is through, you know, flat out employment and hiring discrimination, but other things like mass incarceration. So one of the things that's happened, again, one of those long running issues that needs to be fixed is this trends in mass incarceration where you know there's more punitive sentencing, there's more um, interactions between police and citizens in African American neighborhoods. But then when people come out of prison, there's all these barriers to them. So you think about Pell Grants, you think about public housing. There's so many things that makes it more difficult for people who've been through the uh, justice system to be able to get on their feet and to be able to do well. So one of the things in media solution is removing barriers to returning citizens. Like for example, with the Pell Grants, if you have people who've been through prison have access to Pell Grants, they're able to get education and then be able to work on developing skills that would make them employable. And so that's one of the one examples of kind of like these uh, quick solutions that can be done relatively easily that would help combat these issues of structural racism. But then more broadly, what is it that we need to do to really make sure that we don't have these unequal outcomes? Because one of the things about these unequal outcomes is that we focus on specific groups and we always talk about, oh, well, Native groups are harmed and that's bad, or African-American groups are harmed and that's bad. But it doesn't end there. Because if we approve outcomes for specific groups, for specific individu individuals, they're gonna be able to contribute to this economy. And that makes all of us better off. So when one group of people are harmed, that harm is not limited just to that group. That harm spreads throughout the economy. And we've seen that with this virus, that we've allowed the virus to spread in certain communities and that spread throughout the country. And then we have these huge numbers. So these broader solutions, instead of thinking about it as helping out specific individual groups, it's about making a better, a stronger, a more resilient economy. So one of the broader solutions is the expansion of the administrative capacity of federal agencies. So what we're talking about here is you look at, say, one example is the IRS. Over the last 10 or so years, their funding has been cut. And what that's done is that they haven't been able to engage in enforcement activities. So if you think about who kind of people who evade their taxes or cheat under taxes, the IRS can't go after them to be able to get what is owed. And so there's actually a loss of revenues there. And so the CBO just recently did a study that in the early 2010s, that there was what was called a tax gap of about $300 billion. That's like the federal government would have $300 billion more dollars if the IRS was able to enforce at the level that they need to, to be able to, um, to go after people who do that. And so because their enforcement budget has been cut, it's not just that they can't go after wealthy people or people who are evading their taxes, is that now they're gonna go after low hanging fruit to do their enforcement. So what does that mean? Well, they go after people who might be uh, engaging in earned income tax credit fraud. And so going after people like that. Well, who is that? who are those people? Well, these people are disproportionately low income. These people are disproportionately African-American. So again, that's that structural racism where enforcement, so it's not just that we can't go after wealthy people, but now we use that money to go after poor people and poor black people. And so that exacerbates these unequal outcomes. So if we go back and kind of, you know, increase the capacity of these agencies to go after wealthy people, to go after other people, then we're able to kind of one, you know, 
reverse the trends in increasing racial wealth gap. But then the other thing is actually go after issues of discrimination. So another group is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. So bolster their uh, staff, their resources, their budget, so they can go after these people who engage in discrimination. Second thing is pushing for more pro-worker policy. So it's not just about unionization, but it's about increasing workplace standards. So one of the things that we've seen during this pandemic is that a lot of meatpacking plants have forced a lot of people to go back to work. And we've had these outbreaks spread in these places where people have died and that they haven't had the kind of standards to make sure that people be safe and not die from that. And we need to have more policies that kind of create standards and have any enforcement of that of those standards. We also think about um, pro uh, worker policies like uh, paid family leave and medical leave. So you have people who whose parents or children have gotten sick and they need to take time off to take care of them and to care for them. And so, but if they have, they, a lot of people have this kind of conundrum was like, do I leave work, not get income, but take care of my, but do my caregiving duties or do I stay at work, let them get sick, and then actually spread that to other places? But if we had paid family and medical leave, if we had paid sick leave, then people don't have to make that decision. And then we actually are stronger as an economy. And then finally, equitable infrastructure investment. So I go back to that friendly business environment and that low tax base that has led to basic, poor basic uh, public infrastructure. So if we have infrastructure investment that goes to the places that need it the most, the disadvantaged communities, and this is also more about you know, increasing broadband access because that's part of infrastructure. If we build that back up, then one, people are less likely to succumb to the virus and this pandemic. People are able to engage in remote work and remote education. Um, people are gonna be able to do more. And again, that is not just a benefit to those individuals who are able, who are on the receiving end of that, but it actually benefits the economy as a whole, communities as a whole. People are able to contribute more, be more productive, and we, and and you know all this stuff is about trying to create what I refer to as an inclusive recovery. That you know, 2008 we had the Great Recession, but a, and we had this long recovery, but so many people were left behind that weren't part of this recovery, and that made things harder for them during this pandemic. So one of the things we need to think about is when we have this next recovery, we have to think about a way of having everyone be a part of it. African-Americans, Native groups, Latinx population, rural communities, we need to kind of combat, you know, racial, gender, geographic, income, you know, inequality. We have to combat all that stuff because that's going to make this country stronger, make the economy stronger and more resilient so that there's going to be future pandemics. There's going to be future recessions. We have to find a way that we can bounce back quickly and not have this thing drag out for six months. Because, you know, I think about this, I, I think about what I'm doing right now. And, you know, a couple months ago, Kevin Egan from the econ department said, you know, we'd love for you to come out and speak. And I was like, oh, I'd love to do that. And to think six months later, I'm sitting here in D.C. looking at a laptop, giving this talk when that didn't have to happen. And so the way we have to think about policy now is what can we do? What can we do right now today? What sort of policies can we put in place today so that what's happened this year doesn't happen again? And I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, and then here's just a couple of uh, readings uh, for this. This is excellent. Thank you very much. Um, there's a lot here to discuss. I, yeah. I, I always have questions of my own, but first I should open it up to other people. So does anyone else have a question before I jump in? Anybody have a question they, they would like to ask or comment? Uh, here's a question that came in I'm going to read. It says, thank you for this talk. Do rural populations tend to have a higher percentage of senior citizens than non-rural populations? With more underlying medical conditions and lower income tax bases, et cetera, is it that also a cofactor exacerbating racial inequality and increasing adverse outcomes? That's a great question. And they do. 
um, higher population of senior citizens, higher population of people with disabilities too. And that's why some of these policies are gonna be more, um, one, of the, one of the discussions that's been kind of frustrating during this is people have talked about, oh, well, people have pre-existing health conditions, people have pre-existing problems. And while that might be true, that is not exogenous. That's not an exogenous factor. People with pre-existing health conditions, one of the things I didn't talk about is that during this um, industrial development in the South, and not just limited to the South, but a lot of these communities that are predominantly African-American or predominantly people of color, people who, uh, firms that engage in that a lot of pollution in their industry would locate in these neighborhoods. And so we have this factor of environmental racism so that people have these pre-existing health conditions because they were located near polluting areas. And so then that has this factor there too. And then we look at these rural areas that have higher percentage of senior citizens, then there's a lot less hospital, a lot less, um, we think about home care or long-term services that are very important and that there hasn't been enough funding or resources to those programs. So that's another thing we have to think about. That was a good question. I'll throw in one of my questions real quick. Um, the COVID cases that you showed on the map look pretty consistent throughout the South, but are there any areas of hope within the South? Um, you know, you talked about the, the, the business friendly environment, which to me really sounds antiquated after globalization. It, it seems uh, rather myopic to keep trying that model when, when you're getting beat by other countries. But is there anywhere who, who they've moved on from that model and they've found a better uh, path for growth for their communities, and they were doing better throughout the pandemic. Are there any hopeful cases here? I don't see it here because there's this kind of dichotomy between who is reopening. Because one of the problems is that there hasn't been a consistent nationwide um, scheme or framework to tackle this pandemic. It's been left up to the states. And then in terms of the states, the states haven't really gotten the good guidance to do it. So some states in May pushed for early openings, and then some states did closings. And you know, you know, people want, may want to make it political, but even then, between Democrats and Republicans, it still wasn't much of a difference that there's been a big push by the business community to reopen because there hasn't been the policy to help them survive this pandemic by doing what needs to be done for the virus. And so one of the, and, and so I don't, there really hasn't been in Southern areas and other, I mean, the only good story, as even in quotes, good, would be the Northeast. Because the Northeast got hit hard, made a lot of mistakes early on, but then really pushed to kind of make the right policy to tackle the virus and then have worked to kind of slowly reopen. But even then with the reopenings, they focus more on the business community instead of other communities like childcare, schooling, things like that. So we still we still haven't seen policymakers do the right thing to be able to handle this pandemic. Yeah, that's that's. I was hoping for something more optimistic, but I. <laughs> I'm I sorry. Yeah. No, no, I, no. It's not your fault. <laughs> you you're just telling the truth there. Um, other people, other questions? I'm curious when you say, you know, when you look at the broader solutions, you were saying, you know, I can see how this could be applicable to different eth ethnic groups or different racial groups. What about different countries? Um, you know, again, this model that you discussed of business friendly environment, other countries are doing that. Would the same suggestions that you're making apply to helping working conditions in other countries? You know, maybe Bangladesh or India or anywhere. I think, I think a lot of it depends because when you make cross country comparisons, you have to think about the history of those countries and what's driving that. And so, a lot of people had early on looked to European countries who would shut down the 
country, but then do say a 90% payroll program where they would pay firms to keep their um, employees still attached to the labor market. They wouldn't come into work, but they would continue to get their income so that when this is over, they can go straight back. And part of that is a more, um, not sure the word is, but there was a more kind of, there's more of a interaction between the government sector, the business sector and worker sector that they work together. And there are small cases like that in the US, but it's not as widespread. And so to be able to see if it's going to apply, you have to look at well, what's the history of those countries and then what's the relationship between the, gov- the public sector, the private sector and empl- employees. And so if you have a strong connection, there's more that can be done to be able to tackle this virus. Because the one thing that we seem to be missing in this debate is that everything is driven by this virus. And that once we get a hand on the virus, then the economy can work itself out. But until we do that, we can't handle the virus. We can't handle the economy. And so a lot of times we're you know, kind of putting the cart in front of the horse. And so with these different countries, it's going to be country specific. But I think the key is, can public sector, private sector employees work together to be have a unified vision of how to work through this pandemic and get to the other side? Just to follow up on that, what's really frustrated me with a lot of the public discourse about COVID has been this dichotomy between the economy and the virus, as if they're separate from each other and as if it's a zero sum game between them. Either we can address the virus or we can save the economy. Um, you seem to be saying they're not, they're not separate and you can't do one without the other. Right. Cause we've seen what happened because it's, if you look at like, like for example, movies, I love movies. I love going to movie theaters, but there's no amount of money you could pay me to go see Ted in a theater right now. And that's because I don't want to die. And so the thing is, to be able to get the movie theater business back, to get Hollywood back, we have to get rid of the virus. So it's not an either or. He's not like, oh, well, I need to help save the movie theaters. I'm going to go uh, the Hollywood industry. I'm going to go see a movie. It's like I need to make sure this country needs to make sure that going to see a movie is not going to lead to your death. And that's the whole thing. People going indoor restaurants, that's going to lead to your death. You know, going to bars, going to restaurants, things like that, indoors, that can lead to your death. And so people are not going to go there because they're not willing to risk it. So that's how it works together. So you get rid of the virus, then people are going to start spending money going to movie theaters, going to restaurants, because they feel comfortable that they can do that and not die. And so that's why it's it's not it's never been either or. It's always virus, then the economy. Yeah, I think you need to talk to some people in Washington about that. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, I am trying. Yeah. And actually, that leads me to one last question. And forgive me for asking so many questions, but I promise this will be my last one. You lay out these very clear solutions, short-term solutions, long-term solutions. Excellent. You explain them very well. Perfect. How do we, how do we make these solutions happen? That is a great question. And so I think what I'll do is I'll answer it by talking about how my job has changed from academia to the policy world. So in academia, um, we have like the three stools, the teaching, research, and service. And so in research, you we have a topic, you have a question, you do a deep dive on it, do rigorous qualitative, quantitative work, and then you go through the process of trying to get it published in a journal and takes however long that takes. Um, and then it gets published. And then you try to promote it and try to get that, whatever the topic is, trying to get that to people to listen, to pay attention to it. In the, and but what's interesting, uh, if you're not interested in policy in academia, it's like you get something published and then you're done and then you move on to the next project. In policy world and think tanks, when you write something, that's the start of the process. So you write um, an issue brief, and then you have these policy recommendations. Once you publish it, then it's like, okay, well, who is the audience? So is there, is there a public audience? 
So like, do you write an op-ed with it or do you try to get um, newspapers to write about it, or journalists to write about it, or is it going to the Hill, uh, Capitol Hill? So then you have, you send it to people, staffers, and then you have these conversations with Hill people and they say, okay, well, this is what you need to do. And then, and then you work with them to like write a bill. And then it's not about just having to write a bill and they pass it. What you have is both what they call like an inside game and an outside game. So the inside game is working with the Hill to try to craft legislation. The outside game is to get advocates out, people outside, people to kind of um, raise the issue on the outside to say that, oh, well, this is something that the public cares about. And so you get different groups like, you know, let's say it was doing something like, let's say for this, some groups I would get was like the NAACP or union groups and have them push out like either through social media, through articles, through webinars, through different things to kind of get the issue raised up on the outside. So then people, policymakers understand, okay, this is an important issue that we have to push on the inside. And so that's how it generally works, but it doesn't always work work that well. Yeah, no, that's a very good explanation, actually. That makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, and, and inevitably, it's not going to work perfectly, of course, because you have countervailing forces that are going to be working exactly. against you. So it's a struggle, right. yeah, but... And then um, this, this, actually one thing I want to bring up, it's actually not even countervailing forces against you. Sometimes people on the same side work against you because it's making sure that your priority is the main priority. And so there's always those, there's always that kind of fight. And it's a fight that we've seen during this pandemic. Like there's a push for, you know, businesses to reopen, but it was restaurants versus music venues. And so music venues were trying to push, but they lost out. I mean, they're both on the same side, but then it was, there's the priorities and the restaurants won out over the music venues. And so some of these restaurants are still around, but music venues are dying. And so it wasn't even a countervailing force against them. It was within and to try to get that fight going. So that's another problem. Right. I remember those things. Yeah. Um, very, yeah, very well said. We got a couple more minutes. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments? Okay. Well, I think we'll end it here then. Um, Dr. Ajilar, I just want to thank you again very much. This was, for me, this is very enlightening. And I just loved how clearly you laid out the solutions. Um, well, thank you. So I okay. deeply, we're deeply about appreciate this. you. Yeah, our pleasure. And we're glad that you could come back. Again, we'd much rather have you back face to face. Yes. Uh, but someday, someday, someday we're going to get Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, this is the best we can do. Um, so thanks again. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll do more next week. We'll have a couple more presentations. We'll be in touch about that. And we'll talk to you all then.